Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to look at a microeconomic concept. This is price elasticity of demand and price elasticity of supply, and understanding why primary commodities have predominantly inelastic supply and demand curves, and why manufactured goods have predominantly elastic demand and supply curves. So let's take a look, for example, at coffee, coffee prices. Uh, in this case, it's traded in U.S. dollars, the price per pound. And we can see that in this chart, the price of coffee is volatile. It jumps up and down dramatically over short periods of time. You see these spikes and these dramatic falls. And we can understand that through the concept of elasticity. And let's uh, keep in mind that coffee is an input, right? It is a primary commodity. It is a good that's extracted from the land. Um, and that we're gonna compare that to a manufactured good. So coffee is a key input, let's say for Nespresso's capsules. So Nespre Nespresso buys aluminum and coffee to produce these capsules, which they're able to mass produce um, for their consumers worldwide. We're, we also want to keep in mind that in this input market for coffee, there's about 25 million small coffee farmers throughout the world supplying coffee beans as an input for large firms such as Nespresso to produce their output of coffee capsules. Okay? So what would this look like? Here we have in graph A the supply of coffee beans. This is coming from those 25 million farmers. And perhaps we're looking at um, an individual farmer here and how they're responding to a change in price. This is, can also represent the global market for coffee um, and thus representing the 25 million farmers that are part of this supply curve and then the demand coming not from households, but in this case, the demand is coming from firms. So Nespresso is the firm that we're looking at. And Nespresso is the um, consumer in the input market. So Nespresso as a firm, they go to this input market or this global market for coffee, and they make up the demand. They are demanding coffee to produce their coffee capsules. Now, why is Nespresso's demand curve so inelastic? Because there's no substitute for coffee beans. In order for them to produce the Nespresso capsules, they absolutely need the coffee beans. So their demand curve is very inelastic. In terms of the farmers, the 25 million farmers, they have a very inelastic supply curve because of the length of time, the amount of time they need to produce coffee. They can't suddenly increase coffee production overnight. It takes time to plant and grow. So let's keep that in mind with the primary commodity market. Very inelastic supply due to length of time and inelastic demand by the firm to buy the input because there's no close substitute for Nespresso. They need the coffee beans to produce the coffee capsules. Now in manufactured markets, we see that this is very different. This is an output market, different from the input market. So in the output market, the supply is provided by firms and the demand is coming from households. And we notice that the supply by Nespresso is very elastic. Why? Because they can easily mobilize factors of production like coffee. They can source coffee from 25 million farmers. So if, Viet, if uh, coffee production decreases or if there's a drought in Vietnam, no problem for Nespresso. They can go to the Dominican Republic, to Colombia, uh, to countries in, in Africa like Kenya and buy coffee there. They can also employ other resources like labor and physical capital to increase their production. On top, they have elastic supply because they have perhaps spare capacity in some of their factories, and they have the ability to store stock. They can store their outputs of capsules, keep them in storage, and then distribute them when there's an increase in demand. 
In terms of the demand, this is households. They have an elastic supply curve. I'm sorry, demand curve, because there's other options. There are other ways for them to consume coffee or other drinks. So because substitutes are available for households, they can buy tea, they can buy uh, coffee from another company other than Nespresso. Um, they can make coffee at home if they want to roast it on their own, etc. So there's lots of substitutes available for the consumer, the household, so a very elastic uh, demand curve. So going back to that chart, why is it that the price of coffee is so volatile? Why is it jumping up and down in that input market? So let's look at the input market model. We can see that any slight shift in demand or supply will lead to a dramatic change in price versus the quantity. So let's say, for example, that, um, let's go back, let's use a, a real world example. Uh, I'll go back to, okay. We can see here that in 2010, 2011, the price of coffee increased dramatically from $1.33 per pound to doubling approximately to $2.96. That increase in the price was driven by an increase in demand by Nespresso. Nespresso in 2010 released their coffee machine, their Nespresso machine for households. And because households were demanding their machine and the capsules, that caused Nespresso to increase their demand for the key input of coffee beans. So in 2010, 2011, we see Nespresso going to the input market and increasing their demand for coffee beans. So demand shifts out from D1 to D2. What happens to price? Well, we see that price rises from P1 to P2. Although there's not a dramatic increase in the quantity supplied due to length of time. So demand shifts out. We see that the percent change in price is greater than the percent change in the quantity supplied in this case. All right. So the supply curve is very inelastic. It's less than one. And we also talked about how and why the demand curve is very inelastic because Nespresso doesn't have a close substitute for coffee. So that dramatic increase in price, just leading to a slight increase in quantity supply, is reflected in the price of coffee. We see that it went from $1.33 to doubling to $2.96 approximately. All right. Now, why does it collapse? Well, in this market, again, because of that high price for coffee, that attracts more farmers into producing coffee. So perhaps at that point, maybe there was 25 million coffee farmers. But when other farmers see so much money being made by coffee production, perhaps other farmers are switching into coffee production. Maybe they're producing tea and then they switch into coffee. Let's just assume that that is the case. So that leads to an increase in the global supply. So let's just assume that it uh, shifts out to approximately here. And perhaps let me just erase this. And then we'll continue. So we see that the supply is increase, increasing the global supply. More farmers coming in willing to produce coffee because the price of coffee has doubled so it attracts more farmers, more producers in this input market. So the price rises from P1 to P2, but then collapses again, let's say to an assumed, all right, well, this is you know not drawn perfectly, but I just want to illustrate it's going back to the original P1 price, okay? So we see price rises, price is low, $1.33. It increases due to that increased demand by firms like Nespresso. It attracts more coffee farmers into the market, and then the price of coffee collapses within a couple of years. 
So length of time, yes, it takes time, but as those farmers come in over a year or two, the global supply increases and then the price collapses, okay? Um, and that's it, I mean, this should be a straight line. This is not drawn perfectly, but you get hopefully the idea. So again, the percent change in price always being greater than the percent change in the quantity in the primary commodity market. And we see that being the case for perhaps all commodities, uh, gold, silver, um, iron, uh, timber, wheat, barley, coffee, rice, etc. It has this volatility in price. Okay. In terms of manufactured goods, we don't see dramatic changes in the price. When you buy a mobile phone or a laptop or a pair of pants or a pair of shoes, you don't see the price of those items changing dramatically. And that's due to the elasticity of both the supply and the demand curve. The supplies coming from the firm, like Nespresso, supplying the output of capsules and the demand coming from households. And since households have other alternatives or substitutes, it's elastic. So if there was a increase in demand for Nespresso capsules, we wouldn't see a dramatic increase in the price of those capsules. So let's say that it does shift out. Demand increases from D1 to D2. We see a slight increase in the um, price, but and a dramatic increase in the quantity supplied and demanded. So price increases from P1 to P2, and the quantity supply and demanded increasing from Q1 to Q2. We're moving from point A to point B. So here we see that the increase in the quantity significantly greater than the increase in the price. So again, in manufactured goods, we typically see that the percent change in the quantity supplied and demanded will always be greater than the percent change in price. So prices in manufactured goods are relatively stable due to the elasticity of both the supply and demand curve versus the primary commodity market where the price is very volatile because any change in supply or demand leads to a significant change in price versus the quantity, okay? This is a higher level topic on the new syllabus. And so this is uh, providing you an understanding of why primary commodities are typically inelastic supply and demand curves versus manufactured goods that have typically elastic supply and demand curves. This is a very important concept that we'll see later when we get into global trade and also theory of the firm when we talk about um, perfect competition. So we'll see this concept coming back later in the course. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.